The reading is originally from The Onion. There you go. Say no more. Quote, Following decades of allegations from the 44-year-old data, data processor, the vast sum of all matter and energy called the universe admitted on Tuesday that it was directly responsible for every single hardship in the life of Dave Schwartz and apologized personally for continually foiling him at every turn. Quote, Dave has good reason to say the universe is conspiring against him because it is said the Cosmos, acknowledging it has thwarted Schwartz's hopes and dreams from the moment of his conception. Quote, he may sound melodramatic when he goes on and on and on about the whole world having turned against him, but he's really not that far off. The forces of time and nature genuinely want him to fail at life and fail hard. So yes, the universe added, his anger and frustration are totally understandable. Pointless and futile, but totally understandable. Sources close to Schwartz have long speculated that his failure to find success in work, love, and life had stemmed from his poor decisions and his lack of resolve. But the source, the very source of all causality, verified on Tuesday that just as Schwartz has always claimed, the blame for every misstep and unfortunate circumstance in his life rests squarely on the universe's shoulders. Using the metaphysical concepts of blind chance and cosmic predetermination, as well as other powers beyond human comprehension, the universe claimed to, quote, have done its best to increase the earthly burden on Schwartz, carefully engineering everything from his difficulty concentrating on for more than five minutes, to his receding hairline, to the time he threw up on the playground after eating a whole bag of candy. In addition, numerous essences and karmic forces stepped forward this week to come clean about really piling it on during periods of Schwartz's life when he already had enough on his plate and couldn't be expected to take much more cosmic punishment without snapping. Back in 02, we purposefully made enough things go right for Dave that he actually managed to convince himself that fate didn't exist and that the universe was a hopeful place full of limitless possibilities, all of which could be his as long as he believed in himself and maintained a positive outlook. The universe go went on to say, so two days later, boom, we slam him with an IRS audit and some back pain. Totally threw him for a loop, said the whole of all existence. He literally looked up and asked us, why? Why are you doing this to me? When questioned on Tuesday as to the motive for its actions against Schwartz, the universe told reporters that it had no good answer for it except to speculate that perhaps its essential nature was simply cruel or meaningless or something. We could not contact Dave because at press time, Dave Schwartz was struck, stuck in a traffic jam with severe indigestion. Exactly. All right, let's get away from that silliness. First of all, congratulations again to the search committee. I hope you will be here for both services and candidating week. I will say from my own personal experience, having done this back in 03, that candidating week is a very intense time for the candidate. She is expected to remember and memorize and try to sort out who has done what, where, and when. Please use your name tags. It will be very important. And be patient. Paula and Jorge, thank you again for your music. And to Wayne, thank you for welcoming announcements. So this morning, and I'm kind of surprised so many of you are here today. This morning, I want to convince you that we are all fools. But not just any type of fool. This is a special type of fool 
that is desperately needed in this world. And if there are fools, you're it. <laughs> so what better day to develop that theme than today? I wondered some days ago why April 1st is not an official holiday. It would be a great day to celebrate the absurd. For example, what would happen if Hallmark, just as an example, had a line of greeting cards for April Fool's Day? Would there be special cards with pop-out firecrackers? Would there be flowers that would be sent that are dyed orange every place except Clemson? And in Clemson, they'd be dyed red. <laughs> what about sending people chocolate candies? We've got to have chocolate in here someplace. But chocolate candies that are hollow and have nothing in them. There's all kinds of possibilities. And I am amazed that entrepreneurs in America have not caught on to the great marketing opportunities of April Fool's Day. The possibilities are endless. Now, originally, I thought of doing something silly today. I thought of, for example, having the entire order of service backwards. <laughs> but then someone asked me, did that mean that everyone would leave at the beginning and come back in at the end? <laughs> And even by my standards, that made no sense whatsoever <laughs> because, because the implication is that you would sit here until next Sunday, <laughs> which happens to be Easter Sunday when we're having flower communion slash celebration, and it would be a lovely thing if you brought some flowers. If you're sitting here the entire time, you're not going to do it. So that was out. That wouldn't work. But then I had an aha moment, which comes to interim ministers once in a while, how we could all be fools, capital F. I remembered the reason why I had picked the closing words last Sunday, and I know you all remember them. But I chose them because a fool, capital F, is really a heretic, capital H. Here are the closing words from last Sunday from 20th century poet Edwin Markham. He drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, capital H. Rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. Now, I use that quote because of the word heretic, which I happen to love. It was, it was prominently capitalized and accentuated. So I'm going to take the morning this morning as a little adventure to see if we can be heretics or fools and smile at it. Now, I am mindful that today is Palm Sunday. It's going to be Holy Week and Easter next Sunday. Passover starts on the 6th. And it's not my intent whatsoever to make light of those traditions. And for some of you, I hope you will follow them. And we will speak of Easter and celebrate Easter next week. But I am of the belief that every day, every morning, every moment gives us something to learn. And April Fool's Day, despite all of its silliness, has an important lesson. On the right-hand side of the bulletin, you're going to see two dictionary definitions of heretic and trickster. Now, the definition of heretic is pretty close to the original Greek. And the Greek expression, in its literal meaning, means to choose freely. To choose freely. So you and I know that the word heretic has some connotations these days as being a bad word but it probably fits us pretty well. We have the choice to choose freely without the dubious aid of dogma or sacred teachings that say they are correct and all the others are wrong. So we might be able to argue successfully 
that yes, indeed, we are heretics in the best term of the word. Now, before I go on, I want to introduce you to this really nice little book called The Essential Crazy Wisdom by Wes Nisker. He's a, as you might expect, he's a kind of a crazy Buddhist teacher and writer, and he's also a singer. And in his first couple of chapters, he introduces the cast of what he calls the characters who give crazy wisdom to the world. So here are the labels that he gives. And remember, these are archetypes. Clown, jester, trickster, and fool. Although he does leave heretic out. Because he says that heretic covers all of them in one way or another, in the sense of choosing freely. Now, I want to stand aside here. I am not, and do not come up to the service afterwards, or tell the new minister, or if any of you are references, don't say this either. I am not saying that you here individually are clowns, jesters, tricksters, or so on. You might be heretics, but I'm not calling you clowns or fools, so don't go there. But what I'm saying is that institutionally, Unitarian Universalist faith characteristics include those archetypes. Now, let's start with the clown. Niska says that the clown archetype is the most human of all the archetypes of crazy wisdom. The clown just never gets it right. Early vaudeville and silent movies were filled with clowns like Charlie Chaplin. Niska says that what the clown does is to show us our awkward human condition and encourages us to laugh at ourselves for all the things that we really don't do very well. He or she points out our vulnerability, even though she or he knows they won't succeed. They keep doing it nonetheless. And then they go on to the next adventure, which will then again end with disaster, but a shrug of the shoulders and a determination to stay on. So do we you use short for a Unitarian Universalist, for those who are new. Do we have a bit of a clown? Well, yeah, maybe a little bit. We stumble around sometimes. But one of the things that I've noticed is that we tend to be quite serious people. So I'm not sure about that part. Now the jester. We might think of the court jester, jester in medieval times. The jester was the person who was sometimes called fool or clown as well. And that person was the one person at the court of a monarch or the emperor or wherever in Europe who could tell the truth, disguised as humor, wit, verse, and so on. You see this very often in the plays of Shakespeare, for example. The jester could be subversive and poke fun at the monarch with relative impunity and was a truth teller. Nisker says that the jester is the wit or the critic. They, they expose the lies of the establishment, and they open up the dark corners of society. For example, who might be a good jester? Mark Twain. He was an excellent one. Today, maybe Stephen Colbert or John Stewart are good examples. Now, as Unitarian Universalists, I would suspect we might collectively see ourselves a little bit as jesters. We're pretty skilled at criticizing the establishment and unjust social conditions. But we still are just a little smidgen serious at times. So I'm not quite sure our humor is quite there yet. But there's possibilities. All right, third one. Because then there's Jane over there who just laughs anyway. <laughs> and there's a trickster. The trickster figure is the most archetypal of all of these crazy wisdom figures. It really is not human. We might think of coyote or crow in the American Indian traditions. Communities, societies around the world, especially Aboriginal societies, have had long traditions of this figure 
who turns everything upside down and wreaks havoc and chaos with the world. I've always put it in the term of the idea of someone archetypal seeing a button that says, do not press this red button, and says, oh, let me press it just to see what will happen. It's that kind of thing. And it's probably in all of us to one degree or another. But what I really want to focus on is the fool, capital F. Now, Niska says that there are two types. One is fool, small letter. And that is the type of person we all can be at times in our lives. Or at least I can, I don't know about you. Foolish things that we do. Sometimes, oh, like two years ago, I tossed everything over in my life and got into a new romance with someone who was not a good person to be in a romance with, and I followed that person to the southeast, and lo and behold, I ended up in Clemson, South Carolina, <laughs> and the foolishness of my life was getting involved with the person, but somehow it all worked out that it turned out to be one of the best decisions I ever made. But the foolishness that started it was tossing over everything else in my life to come here. But then it changes in wonderful ways. We survive foolishness, and we learn from it, hopefully. But another example of foolishness, buying lottery tickets. There's a possibility, <laughs> except for three people somewhere in the United States. So we can probably all think of foolishness that we've done, but that's not really what we're talking about today. We're talking about great fool, capital G, capital F. Niska says that the character of the great or sometimes called holy fool is essential in any age. It is the person or character or archetype who is able to look outside the box, as that famous saying goes now, who's able to create new stories, new parables, and new connections between people and ideas, because what he or she can do is connect the dots in all kinds of new ways and leaving no one out. Speaking old truths in new stories and new ways to fit the world as it is and not a thousand years before. Great holy fools are people such as Jesus or the Buddha, or Muhammad, or Gandhi, or many others. They were the women mystics who, in the medieval period, were locked up in monasteries and convents because they told very inconvenient truths. And their vision was much broader than any males could stand. The great or holy fools are those who laugh out loud at religious or secular orthodoxy. They always associate themselves with the poor or marginalized because they see compassion as universal and not exclusive. The greater holy fools are those people who make society one as opposed to us and them. You're against us or you're for us. They seek justice for all rather than justice for the acclaimed few. That's some of what they are. So what crazy wisdom archetypes might we, you, use be? Let's go back to the story about poor old Dave. Most of the people I know would laugh or at least smile at such tongue-in-cheek humor. I also know people who would not laugh whatsoever. Among them would have my, been my foster parents who were born in the early 20th century. They had no sense of humor about things like this and would not have understood it in the slightest. I suspect many depression era people would not have understood it. Other folks I know would have been offended because they would have thought it was a sneaky way to make fun of God and the Bible. Still others, and I know you're not here, of a strongly rational or scientific mindset might have bypassed the humor entirely and prepared arguments that refute the idea of the cosmos having any aspects of predetermination. I'm sure there are others. Nonetheless, it is a funny and ironic story, at least to me. 
The Onion is noted for satire and biting humor that pokes fun at political correctness, jabs all sides, leaving no one out, and points out how absurd we all can be at times. So let's suppose we could identify with that story as one of the writers, or maybe Dave himself. Which one of the crazy wisdom characters or archetypes would we be? Well, the clown figures in the story because we can at some level understand Dave's hopeless struggles. Who among us has not been caught in traffic with severe indigestion at times? How many of us at one time or another in our lives hasn't got, why me? And of course not gotten an answer. We're all in that place sometime where we're a clown. The jester is a part of us who might be the writer of the story of Dave and the universe. The jester pokes fun, and she or he is able to speak inconvenient truths and make people laugh, even if just a little bit uncomfortably, and making sure everybody else is laughing around them. So I think there's a piece of that there, too. Now, the trickster, as I said before, is a difficult part because the trickster is not human. It is an archetypal force that is so primal and is so mythic that I don't know what characteristics we have of the trickster in us, but I would bet that there's a good sampling here at this congregation. It tends to fit liberal, uh, religious liberals, by the way. But I would think that we would fit a little bit more deeply as great fool in the storyline of Dave and the universe. We laugh at ourselves in the storyline because we see bits of ourselves in what happens to poor Dave. We laugh because we know for a fact that the universe is far stranger and far more mysterious than we can ever know. We know and we laugh because we know that whether it's God or Tao or the force or some other law of cause and effect, we can probably safely say that we will never be able to define it or embrace it fully. We refuse to accept that there's any one name of God or no God that is the one true name and nature because we know that the mystery of it all is larger than we can ever grasp. And after all, isn't the essence of a great fool, and yes, this is what I'm suggesting you are, and I am too, is to carefully note the two ways of the future, as Woody Allen has said in the opening words. And then when we see those two opportunities, those two actually dangerous ways, one to despair and one to extinction, then what we do is outside the box and say, there's got to be a third way. There must be another way. There's got to be something beyond the joke, the dualism, the good and evil. If that way is there, we need to find it. So if we're the type of fool, capital F, religion, that cheerfully challenges and pokes at the corners of reality, what is our role in the 21st century? If we're the folks who are just foolish enough to challenge the orthodox to say, whoa, wait a minute, there's another way here. Or to say to the universe, no, I don't believe in you being that mean and cruel to me or Dave. If there is another way, therein is the third path. Are we going to be tossed around as Dave was in a story, or do we laugh out loud as with joy as heretics? Because we, we are able to choose freely. Now, I don't quite know what the answer is yet, but I'm going to suggest you come back next week, because that's when I'm going to explore that question on Easter. Stay tuned. Let's see what happens next.